Video number 7, part 2. Why the existence of the Planck-CMB Hubble constant, dark matter and dark energy are challenged by the law of universal propulsion of matter. Although this video can be viewed as a standalone, it would be more meaningful if you were to watch video 6 or part 1 first. So I am repeating some elements from part 1 to ensure the completeness of this video. I am also planning to publish some abridged summaries of my videos for those who do not have the patience to watch the whole thing through. In the middle of the 20th century, mathematicians established the physical reality of the anomalously high velocities of stars in various scenarios. They couldn't understand why they defied Newton's laws, so they called it dark matter. Much later, they also established the physical reality of the exponential acceleration of matter into the void. They were even more puzzled by this phenomenon, so they called it dark energy. They couldn't explain these strangely anomalous phenomena because they didn't have the law of universal propulsion of matter to guide them. So they made the fatal mistakes of inventing entities whose physical existence cannot be proven using all of the scientific expertise that our civilization can muster. And so they have screwed up cosmology and astrophysics ever since. What will always puzzle me is why nobody in the astronomical community considered the possibility that matter could be self-propelled. The big question for me now is how an entire scientific community so committed and so far down the line into believing in the existence of dark matter and dark energy can bring themselves to recognize that dark matter is the biggest scientific mistake of the 20th century, followed closely by dark energy at the end of the century. My mission in this series of seven videos has been, if nothing else, to introduce unease, to introduce doubt and to challenge the entrenched mainstream dogmatism about dark matter and dark energy. So, in this video, I go further and am also challenging the creators of the Planck CMB Hubble constant to think again about the fundamentals of the parameters they are using in creating it. In part one, I ran two tests to demonstrate that our universe requires an additional law to add to Newton's laws in order for it to function without the addition of endless caveats. I ran the tests on dark matter and dark energy, and if you apply this law of universal propulsion to them, I show that both dark matter and dark energy are redundant. In other words, they don't exist. The new law of universal propulsion states that because matter has the fundamental property of propulsion, which is directly proportional to its mass, just like gravity is, as bodies of matter recede away from other bodies of matter, acceleration will increase by the square of the distance between them according to the inverse square law. And so, when you apply the law to the anomalous velocities of stars in most scenarios, I show that there is an alternative explanation for why stars, galaxies and globular clusters and groups of galaxies have much higher velocities than they should have if we presume that we live in Newton's gravity momentum universe. I show that it is perfectly plausible that if stars are self-propelled and if the self-propulsion is directly proportional to their mass, just like gravity is, then they and every other astronomical body will fly at the much higher velocities that they do because they are obeying the inverse square law. Now you can dismiss the nonsensical huge gravitational halo that surrounds every astronomical entity that has an anomalously high velocity. The same applies to phantom dark energy. 
In the case of phantom dark energy, I have also shown that if matter has the fundamental property of propulsion, then the alternative scenario is perfectly plausible that matter itself is accelerating exponentially into the existing void, causing the exponential increase in the boundaries of our universe. This law of universal propulsion is a physical law which works in our physical universe. Its existence is a very simple to understand law, which is as obvious as gravity is, and it explains why most, if not all, of the astronomical bodies in the universe have anomalously high velocities. The simple fact is, an object cannot accelerate unless it is self-propelled or is gravitationally attracted to something else, or is being driven by some other propulsive force. But then there is another outlandish, mathematically created idea that matter is not being propelled, but that space is magically expanding, making it appear as if matter is accelerating. It is only mathematicians who can concoct such weird and wonderful explanations like this, when there are simple physical explanations for obvious physical effects. And if this law does apply universally, then it will be evident that the sum of gravitational energy and propulsive energy in the universe will be as constant as is the total of baryonic matter from the moment of the Big Bang. So you don't have to keep injecting phantom energy into our universe to make it work. Now you should be able to see that the universe is a much simpler organism than astrophysicists would like us to believe. And so, to remind you, I said in part one of this sequence, which was video number six, that we can run a third test of the law of universal propulsion to show that the rate of acceleration of the early universe increased progressively as matter consolidated into ever larger masses. This is a physical process obeying all of the known laws of physics, but with the addition of the law of universal propulsion of matter. And so to test number three, which is where I explain how it works. Test number three, the beginning of the universe. The third test of this new law is a discussion about the Planck CMB Hubble constant, how the universal law of propulsion relates to it and affects it and why it is flawed. The Planck CMB Hubble constant says that the universe is expanding at a rate of 67.8 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This has been calculated using, amongst others, two parameters whose physical existence I am challenging. These are dark matter and dark energy. The alternative Hubble constant, which uses type 1a supernova and pulsating Cepheids, to calculate a figure of 73.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec uses physically proven measurements to arrive at its result. This measurement computes the acceleration of the expansion of the boundaries of our universe and conforms to the universal law of propulsion of matter. If I have to choose between two constants, one using two unproven parameters and the other using physically proven measurements, I know which one I would choose and it would certainly not be the Planck-Hubble constant. There is general agreement that the difference between the two constants cannot be explained within the framework of the standard model of Big Bang cosmology. And therefore new science is required to explain the 8.5% difference in the measurement of the rate at which matter is accelerating into the void and causing the acceleration of the expansion of the boundaries of our universe. If the Planck CMB Hubble constant is right, then our universe has expanded at a slower rate than the Hubble Type 1a supernova constant says it has, because the Planck model is the lower of the two. The Planck CMB Hubble constant is based on the standard cosmological model. And so physicists are questioning whether any of the parameters used in compiling the standard model 
of Big Bang cosmology changed as the universe evolved, making it appear as if the universe is expanding at a slower rate. This is the issue I'm addressing in this video, and I hope to show why both gravity and the rate of acceleration of matter changed as the universe evolved, therefore making the fixed parameters used in compiling the Planck CMB Hubble constant highly suspect. So coming back to the early evolution of the universe, in order to discuss whether or not the rate of acceleration of matter changed as the universe evolved, we have to refer to the standard model of the evolution of the universe from the moment of the Big Bang. This model is the generally accepted model which is also described as the timeline of epochs in cosmology or the chronology of the universe. You will find these in Wikipedia and the various headings. And when studying the timeline, I have picked out a number of critical points on it as matter evolved towards its current state in order to show how the rate of acceleration of matter might have changed due to the change in the material state of the universe. But for you to believe this series of scenarios, you have to accept that our universe is governed not only by Newton's laws, but also by the additional law of universal propulsion of matter. In the beginning, matter was a disorganized primordial soup in which gravity and propulsive force were completely ineffectual as the momentum from the Big Bang overwhelmed any other forces and was the primary driving force in the explosion of matter into the void. According to cosmologists, due to the effect of gravity, slowly at first matter began to coalesce into lumps, then ever larger lumps. These eventually became self-igniting stars. The larger the lumps grew, the greater the force of gravity became, generating ever larger lumps of matter. At the same time as their size grew, so did their propulsive force, which also grew in direct proportion to the increased sizes of the lumps of matter. This resulted in dynamic movement of adjacent lumps of matter as they organized into larger and larger structures. It took 200 million to half a billion years for stars to organize themselves into these large structures by the combined forces of propulsion and gravity. Early on, the force of propulsion of matter is used up, counteracting gravity, by driving the revolution of stars into stable orbits around black holes. But, as the universe evolves, and as masses of black holes, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies increase, so do the forces of gravity and propulsion of matter increase in the large structures, in direct proportion to the increase in the masses until a critical point is reached. According to the received wisdom of cosmologists, it was not until the age of around 5 billion years in the evolution of the universe that propulsive force added to momentum caused the acceleration of stars and galaxies to become significant. And it was from this time that exponential acceleration into the void became measurable. But gravity was still the dominant force holding back the acceleration. This was the gravity-dominated era. Due to both the continuing amalgamation of masses and systems of masses and the increasing distances between them at around the age of 9 billion years into the age of the universe, the combination of momentum and propulsive force dominated gravity and we entered the propulsion-dominated era. Therefore, according to what I have deduced, provided that you buy into the universal laws of gravitation and propulsion, it is easy to conclude that from the moment of the Big Bang, due only to the fact of the consolidation of matter into ever larger masses and collections of masses, the force of propulsion of galactic masses, as is the case with gravity, will increase in direct proportion to the increase in those masses. 
This, of course, means that the rate of acceleration of the expansion of the boundaries of our universe will increase progressively. So coming back to the Planck CMB Hubble constant, elusive dark matter has to be relocated into black holes, which is a fitting end to it. But the gravitational effect of it in galaxies remains and is counteracted by the propulsive force of stars, which enables them to fly as fast as they do, resulting in their anomalous velocities. In order to devise a Planck-Hubble constant that correctly reflects the evolution of the early universe, you have to have a formula which takes account of the progressively increasing forces of gravity and propulsion, resulting from the amalgamation of matter into ever larger masses and clusters of masses. You also have to take account of the progressively increasing separation of galaxies and collection of galaxies because of the effect of the inverse square law. This discourse is of necessity simplified as many other factors are at play as the early universe evolves, but it will serve to illustrate the specific point of how the consolidation of matter into ever larger masses results in a directly proportionate increase in the rate of acceleration of matter. The larger the masses or collections of masses, the greater their propulsive force. Thank you for watching my video. But before you go, if you have enjoyed or been inspired by my video, please subscribe to me or give me thumbs up.